we are also taking questions during the session. So if, if Andreas is talking about something that you might want clarification on, or if you wanted to do a deeper dive in specific sections, you can def definitely put your questions in the chat and you can also unmute yourself, go on camera and, and have a conversation. We have a, a small enough group that it allows for us to actually talk to each other as a little conference call here. But Andreas, I'm going to pin your, I'm going to spotlight you for everybody in just a second, just so uh, we have more people coming in, just so we have the focus on you. This is a wow. circle spotlight session. So we're, we're going to use that term in Zoom and spotlight you. But before we get into the actual topic of data engineering for all, I think it would be great for you to do a little introduction, let people know who you are, what you do, and then I'll briefly talk to them about what to expect for the session and then we'll get it. Yeah, I'm Andreas Kretz. I'm from Germany, here right out of Germany. Uh, I was born in Germany and I love it here. I live here with my wife and the two kids. So maybe you hear the kids outside during the talk. Can always be. I'm in the data realm for a long time. I actually had my, went to university on computer science and then worked with SAP uh, or as an SAP consultant a year, which I didn't really like. And then I got into the whole yeah, data realm and processing data and working with IOT data. So for this, I'm within the, it was called big data in the early days. I actually didn't know that I was working with big data or that I had a big data problem. I only, only found that out during the time I was working on my projects. And yeah, in that area, it's, I think it's the 10th year now I worked as a platform architect, as a data engineer, as a data engineer team lead. And in my last stage as a, as a team lead of a data lab, where I worked with data scientists and with data engineers. And since the myth of last year, I'm full-time working at my own company at learndataengineering.com, where I uh, basically teach data engineering, as it says, learn data engineering. Awesome. Thank you for any that. Questions that. Oh, any questions around that? Oh, any questions around that? Yeah. We'll take yeah. Questions. Yes. Yes. And I know Andreas for several years now, we connected a long time ago and oh, more people joining us in the meeting room. I'll just let those in. We're going to, we're going to go ahead and get started with the topic. And as a quick reminder, if you do have questions for Andreas during the session, feel free to either put them in the chat or if it feels natural, feel free to unmute and go on camera. This is, we're trying to make this really interactive. So if you want to participate, definitely feel free to, to be on camera and um, join the conversation. The way this is going to work is Andreas will present for about 20, 30 minutes. He has, uh, he has some great content prepared for you guys. This will be available. This is being recorded after the session as well, if you wanted to replay. And then we'll take about 15 minutes for Q&A and then another 15 minutes for our networking session. We have some great ideas for the networking session in the breakout rooms today, so definitely stay tuned. So I will go ahead and spotlight you, Andreas. I'll go on mute Thanks. and feel free to share your screen whenever you need. Yep. Okay. Data engineering. The thing is, I don't 100% know how much you already know about data engineering. So I kept this, I'm going to start very easy on this. And I brought an example where we can go through a lot of topics, but I'm not going to go into all of the details. This is more that either during the talk or afterwards that you ask me deeper and then we can, it's a rabbit hole. We can go endlessly deep down here, but I don't want to bore you with all the details. So I actually brought 10 slides. It's not a, I'm, we're not going to do a slide overkill. So let me bring that up. So this is the first slide. I want to make a bit of an example or use the example of Tesla today and a bit about self-driving cars. A lot of people might think self-driving cars, how does that come into contact with data engineering? Because it's a car and they have their 
algorithms on top of the car and maybe they have the screen here that you can't see but we're data engineering eh. it's more an analytics topic it's actually not so if you think of all of uh, of this why doesn't it go here further so on the left we have our self-driving capability that is our goal and what do you need for the self-driving capability you need the car which is the main product that you see with tesla and now you have to think of okay how do you now get from the car to the left to the self-driving capability and the thing that is a lot of to a lot of people who are in the data science realm very logical you need that on the right you need the children the data scientists playing around with the data and coming up with a good solution coming up with good algorithms that actually get put on the car now what i like about tesla is not just using the car for the transportation they're using the car to actually yeah work build the algorithms and create new solutions like what you with the self-driving capability and so on now, how do you get from driving the car to the analytics to the self-driving that's the one thing that is missing in this picture and the one thing that is missing and what we're all talking about all the time it's the data now the best algorithms you cannot build any algorithms without data and that's what i also like about tesla is that they basically use the car as the data source the data is a piece of the product so that's very unique they start they were basically the first ones now the bigger car companies like mercedes and so on and they they are all trying to go this route but the data is the integral part in this and for that you need to somehow work with the data now what do you need for this you have on the left you have your car on the right you have the self-driving capability somehow you need to now work with that data with the data that is coming in and for that you basically the thing that you need is you need a platform and whenever you look at a platform you can very generally look at it like this that you say on the left here the car somehow interfaces with with the platform so there is a way or the the platform gives the car a way of actually sending data or receiving data from the platform and that's one of the integral parts that you have a layer of interfaces on the right then you have a layer of visualization very often where either you have an app there or a dashboard or something like a web in a website where you can see some statistics and so on and then in the middle the two biggest parts in there usually is the data storage and is the actual processing and the processing this is where your data scientists are working in this case of the self-driving capability the data comes from the cars they're they're working on the analytics they're trying to figure out how to make this better they're doing the testing and so on and this is how you get basically from hardware that is getting moved into a function through data now this is where where all the engineering is coming in because this data platform is not getting created out of nowhere and the data isn't getting put through there on its own the processing is we are talking the analytics this is more of a job for a data scientist but the actual platform is is the data scientist uh, the data engineer's job okay any questions around that before we move into the details? I think you're good. And Joyce, I love the um, Tesla example. It is on my personal goal list to buy a Tesla at some point in my life, maybe in the next few years. That's like a, a little symbol I'm, I'm, I'm going after. So very interesting for me to, to learn behind the scenes work that, that goes on. So definitely looking forward to, to hearing more. Yeah. Yeah they're nice cars interesting cars let's make a, a quick a, a bit of a, a dive into the platforms so the thing is 
whenever you look at a platform, I made this blueprint a long time ago, but it still it still holds true to what I see basically everywhere. And here you see the things that we were talking about before. You have the APIs, you have the interface, application programming interface on the left. They are packed within a whole stage of like, I call this data integration or integration. And on the, where you have like APIs or you have some external tools, external systems, like other parts of your company that are hosting these interfaces or uh, you have a data warehouse within the company that is not part of your analytics platform, but like it's in day-to-day -day production uh, or databases from your from your production line and so on, or sales databases and so on. And so you have, that is on the left, that is where you get the data from. And on the right side, this is where we have our, where we have our visualization where we say, okay, we, we're generating web user interfaces or the analysts are working on the BI tools and analyzing stuff. And, or where you say, okay, I'm, I'm having an app here for my customers where they can work, they can watch their information or their statistics for the car in this example. Hey, Tesla. Andreas. Quick question here. So we have the integrate, the store, the visualize, and obviously there's a lot of different tools and platforms involved here. So can you talk a little bit about how all of they all of these tools work together? Are they is it easy to get them all to talk to each other? I'm I'm going to talk to about that in a sec, but generally it's not always as easy. It depends a bit on what you're doing. It's getting easier. So this, generally this thing, um, I created more, I create without the tools because you can insert the tools there depending on where you are. But before, before I go more into that, I have these examples for Tesla. I actually put in tools, but generally in the, and then in the middle, what you have is you have something very often you see the message queues, see buffers for the stream processing. You see a processing framework where you can do either stream processing where data is coming in constantly or where you can do batch processing where you say, okay, every hour, every day, I process some data or I train a model or something. And then you have basically your data stores from data lakes to the databases or the more traditional relational databases. I very often I write SQL people often get annoyed because they say this is a language, this is a query language and not the database but and then you have your like your your NoSQL database or a data warehouse in this in this example so this is basically the blueprint that you see all the time and now the idea is to actually go there and build pipelines on top of this so how do you connect each of these layers with each other to actually solve a problem and this is also where you see the different roles come into play where you see the analysts the scientists and the engineers uh, come into play so you, you're going to see that for instance the analyst that who sits here on on the bi tools the the analyst most likely is going to hear access data from your data warehouse and is going to analyze the data and, and build reports on this very in a very classical way of of analyzing the data or working with the data then very often you have the data scientist who is for instance working here building a trying to train a model and the data scientist then is going to access data that is coming out of the data lake here and maybe the results then go into a into a NoSQL database this is uh, very often where these where these two two types of of uh, people work the analyst more on the warehousing front more on the bi tool front the the scientists a, a lot especially in the early stages on yeah, building the analytics trying to find a good solution and then later also deploying this into uh, very often into stream processing where if data comes in then it gets analyzed and then it gets basically put 
to the destinations. Now, here's where the data uh, engineer is coming into play. You have your data here on the left, the sources, and somehow you, you now need to feed the analysts and the scientists to actually work with the data, to be able to have the data. And the engineer's job is, okay, I have these data sources. Let's try to like funnel the data through here into these stores, for instance, so that the scientists can work with it. So to feed uh, data into the data lake, to feed data into the warehouse, to uh, make sure that the data gets into the relational databases and transformed in, in and checked uh, during that time or in the process of, of, of getting uh, put there. Uh, any questions around that? Because this is a, uh, I think this is a crucial thing for people to understand where yeah, are the different roles actually working? Yeah questions so there's a data analyst data scientist data engineer obviously they all have different roles they play in different platforms they they use do you see in your experience a lot of movement between these roles do you do you typically have a data analyst transferring into a data scientist role data engineer role or do they tend to stay mostly in their fields let me stop this here we, what you see very often is that people start to transition from a, a data analyst role into one of the two other roles. Either they're going more the data scientist role, if the analyst is more, okay, I'm interested in working with the data to, to get a, or to, yeah, to make some analytics and, and get some good results with the data. A lot of people that I have also in my academy is that they're making the switch from analyst to engineer because they're actually interested in uh, working with the data on a way of getting it in and trying to bring it into the right format and to work with uh, with interesting tools as well. Uh, so that's that they're more into the engineering thing. They maybe they come from a from an engineering profession. So that's the, the shift that you see, that I see very often from the analyst side. There's also a shift from the, or not, it's not really a shift. Sometimes it's a shift that I see uh, scientists who actually realize the hype isn't that, wasn't that real. And I don't actually like to sit in front of the computer all day and just create my, my, my Python code. I want to have a bit more with the engineering. So they are, they're also transitioning into engineering. That's what happened. Joe Rice, for instance, on, on uh, one of our LinkedIn buddies made that switch uh, a few years ago. He's always calling himself the recovering data scientist. There are also the things where, or the instances where people actually uh, are in the position that they are a data scientist and they are either in a small company or in an early stage project where there is no engineer, there is no engineering department, nothing. They need to set up a proof of concept and they're alone. So they need some engineering knowledge to set something up on the cloud, right. set some easy pipelines. Yeah. And that's what I get a lot. I had a lot of data scientists in my coaching classes. I also have a lot in, in my academy. So th these are the things that I see uh, this, which a lot. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. I think it will be interesting to hear from the other participants if they can either unmute or put it in the chat. If they're um, more aligned with a data scientist, data analyst, or data engineer role. And uh, while they do that, I'm actually putting a comment in the chat here, Andreas. This came from Dolly. She couldn't make the live session, but she wanted to see if we can cover this. So she'll watch the recording. And her question is, how should data engineering work if you're a data analyst? How do I enhance my skill set in data engineering as an analyst? What should I prioritize first when trying to learn more? And then she gives you a little shout out here that she appreciates your topic on LinkedIn and your newsletter. So you've got a fan there. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. And that's a good question. Because when you want to make that shift or when you want to improve there are a ton of things that you can do within data engineering. But as an analyst, what I think would make sense is 
so you're already working here with the, with the BI tools and you're already working here. Oh, let's make, oh, I want to make this red. You're already working here with your data warehouse very often. So you have this skill you have. You also have the uh, SQL querying skill and so on. Now, one thing how I would improve here is trying to actually work and feed the data into this warehouse. And a lot of times what you see is that, and this is a lot of engineering work where people are actually uh, setting up an analytics platform and the central part of this is the warehouse and they have some, sometimes I call this legacy, but it's like the production systems. They have some production databases and they actually want to work with the data. The goal or how I would start is I would try to build ETL jobs that actually take that data and then put this into the warehouse. So that this way, get to know a bit more about relational databases, relational database design. You also get to know about ETL processing frameworks that depends on the platform that you are, which ones you're using. You could use Spark, you could use some very simple, sometimes these are very simple Python codes. Yeah, but these are some tools like uh, Informatica or Airbyte or Talent or, or stuff where you're getting, you're actually getting the data from the outside and putting it into your warehouse and then processing it there and bring it into the right format. Because this makes you a bit more self-sufficient than before. So either way, if you decide, either you just don't, you decide, ah, maybe I don't want to get a full-blown data engineer or become a full-blown data engineer, or uh, you know, you know, basically you want to improve your skills, then this would be a good way of starting to make this connection and try to get the data in because it's, it's endless. You could also say, okay, maybe very often here, and I do this sometimes with my coaching students who are in this, in this situation that we are also adding APIs there that we say, okay, interface is hosted somewhere. Maybe you don't have direct access to the database, but you have to query the data from, from somewhere. And this is, then you learn how APIs work. You can learn how to design APIs, what to look for, how to work with them, basically how to query them. And th these are things I think for, for a, for an analyst, it's a good way of starting because you you still have that part that you already know and you're not starting from zero. You're just adding more stuff because you, you could also go the other way and you could say, okay, I'm going to start APIs and messaging queues and stream processing and everything. But uh, this is more a second step. Stick to or keep doing what you're doing. What you're doing. Very helpful. And I see, yeah, we have George uh, joining us here as well. Um, just as an update, we're, we're almost through with the content piece of, of this inner circle session and soon, soon we're getting to more of the Q&A. So if you do have questions, definitely put them in the chat or, uh, you know, unmute yourself and speak. Oh, I see Avery's off. Nice. Not, not, no longer hiding. Avery, guys, get ready to, to go on camera shortly. We did have a, a question here. Not a question, it's more of a comment. Caroline says you know, she's in a university student right now, doesn't have a role just yet, but she's exploring and learning more about the landscape. So I thought yeah. it would be a, a good point of discussion to maybe talk through the three roles and one answer, do we have to have, do we have to go through a phase where we're like a data analyst, data scientist, then become a data engineer, or if somebody wants to be a data engineer, can they simply start learning how to become a data engineer? What, what are some of the prerequisites? The first thing that I would look for is or I would try to find out, am I more an analytics person or am I more an engineering person? This is the, the central thing. So if you're more the analytics person, you most likely want to go more into the data scientist field. Uh, if you're more the engineering person, most likely data engineering is the thing that, that you're interested, that you're interested in. It's these things, as I said before, people making the transition or adding the skills. So it's not like, 
a good data scientist can never work with engineering and an uh, engineer who is really good and also likes to analyze data can never be uh, in the data science field. For me personally, I'm an engineer and I'm not going to go into that route, but people do that. So if you're, yeah, about that. The second question about the computer science or the part of the computer science student. Computer yeah, science I saw is... that one come from Vedant. Yeah, so he's a computer science and interested in analytics and is asking how to get into the analytics space right after graduation. Yeah. Has previously worked on analytics and visualization project. The thing, how can um, look for a job, try to do an internship, and then the, the thing he... is that <laughs> I. The thing is, what you uh, get with the internship, you get a bit of credibility. Right. You need some kind, of, some some credibility. I know Avery because I see him here, and I we're on the same page on building projects yourself and showcasing this. Right. So if you decide, okay, I want to go into analytics, I also have done some projects showcase these projects, document them on GitHub or do blog posts or YouTube videos and mm -hmm. like package this into your job applications and into your uh, interviews. Yeah. Yeah. I would say you content creation some... on that note of the, the GitHub, the project portfolios, I think content creation of your process as well, documenting what you're working on, what you're learning as you're learning it. And putting it out there on social media on medium articles is also very helpful because it gets you noticed and it's it helps build your brand. So now Vedant, as if you keep posting about analytics related topics, people will be like, oh yeah, Vedant analytics. Whenever there's a job opening, they'll know who to go to, or if they have questions, they'll know you as the expert. I think that can be helpful as well. Yeah. It's also good for yourself that you have some sort of a documentation what you have done, how did things work? Sometimes I just, when I try to figure stuff out, I just hit the recording button on my, uh, and, and make a screen recording of it so that I can maybe later go back and actually look at this. Ah, okay. This is how it worked. It's for That's, the course creation sometimes. <laughs> yes, I know. Good. That's actually how I got into content creation to begin with. I, I did something in Tableau that was really complicated and not in their default settings. So I'm like, okay, I'll make a video of myself doing this because I know I'll forget all the little steps I had to take. And I, I didn't feel like writing it all out. It was less record your screen and see what you did. Yeah. I think that's helpful. And if you don't feel like, like sharing this, then just use it for yourself. And you yeah, I started doing that for my team everything. and then eventually now the world can see it. We had a few questions here from George. So let's take yep. the first one. Do you think the yep. data engineer's role will be more automated with some of these upcoming services? I think so. I think the tedious stuff is getting more and more automated. The problem is always, well, for, for us engineers, it's not really the problem. It's a good thing that the actual, the designing phase and the setting up, the figuring out how to do this is still a thing that you have to do. It's hard to automate very often. The easiest jobs get automated. If it gets more and more complicated, then the automation level goes down because it's not simply just dragging, dragging something here and connecting these lines and then that's it. Yes. And luckily no <laughs> is, the, is the answer for this. Okay. Let's, because we're, I see already, we, we need to push a bit. I have two more slides that I want to show. Yes. One thing I want to show you an example of batch and streaming pipeline and coming back to the Tesla example. Now, a, a typical batch, I was talking about batch pipelines earlier on the blueprint. Now, one thing that you, the car does when it comes home at night, it's going to send data to Tesla. Now, that's a very interesting thing that they did. I don't know how big it is. I think it, it was at some point nine gigabytes a night or something that the car actually sent over to Tesla, basically using statistics and so on. And how would that work? So the idea is, okay, what could you do with this? We could say, okay, I'm taking my, the car is connected to like on AWS, the data lake on S3, you have just files. 
it's going to drop these at night it's going to drop the data into a bucket and, and every car has a bucket or has a folder in there. And then once at night or for the next day, you say, okay, for my car, for each of the cars, you're starting a processing job. Let's say with one car, you're starting a processing job, for instance, on um, uh, Elastic MapReduce, a Spark job or on Glue. And this job analyzes all this data and comes up with some statistics, some usage data of your car, some tips that what you could do to save energy while driving or your consumption of the day based on the location or whatever. And these analytics results could then go in two ways. And this is basically where the engineering is also going to come in, where you can say, okay, I'm, you're, we're pushing the data towards a, a database, towards a transactional database. And uh, this database is the source of the data, for instance, for the app. So if you start your Tesla app, the app is going to access an API on API gateway. And this API is then going to basically pull the usage statistics from our database. And this gets refreshed every night or every, whatever, every hour or something. In this case, it would be every night. The other thing is you could, you could use these results and put them into the internal data warehouse. So the analysts at Tesla then can do some statistics and look at some statistics through the warehouse. Now, this is for one ex example, for one car, you could scale this basically to all the cars. So all the cars at night, put the data in here, you start jobs that are accessing all this data and cr creating all these results and putting these results for the, for the customers into into these types of stores and putting the data for the internal analytics teams into these kind of stores. Could also add a data lake here and, and separate data lake for transform data or something. So that's one way of, of creating a batch pipeline that you schedule. You say, okay, I want to have this type of results once per day or yeah. So that's a, a example for a batch pipeline. Now I also brought an example for a streaming pipeline. Let's say you're having a flat. It's a simple thing where you're on the highway and you have a flat and the car actually sees this early because the sensors in the, the, the pressure sensors in the tires are going to see this and they're going to uh, then send the data out uh, through, for instance, also on AWS through API gateway and into a message queue kinesis. And this then automatically gets pushed into a Lambda function that starts, triggers or creates an alarm in the database and adds the telemetry data to the database. So somebody who is in the service center and is watching the dashboards, look at that, at these alarms, sees, oh, there's an alarm popping up and it says the alarm already says a uh, flat tire. And here's the information where the car is, how long, yeah, this happened ago and most likely immediately, but maybe the, the driver, the, the owner or something and the phone numbers, and then the service person can actually look at this dashboard or can get, can get informed and can call the driver and ask for, do they, do you need roadside assistance or can we, can we, yeah, can we help you either way in any way? And this way, this is for one, one car. This could be, you can use a pipeline like this for all the cars in the fleet. You can not only do this for flat tires, you could basically for all the, whatever, how, I don't know how many thousands of errors these cars can actually throw these situations. You can have this for all the situations where in this way you can basically immediately interact and you could, you could also say, have a prediction algorithm here that predicts what has failed or what's the actual root cause of this problem and how to like, it's, it's this is really, this is a bit of where I, where my heart starts pumping because this is not just, a, this is once a day and something, this is, you can act immediately, start a customer service and say, okay, then let's ship the predicted, the predicted part that you need to the next service station where the car is getting towed. For instance. So it's really cool. Really cool so and really are, complex. Yeah. My goodness. Like I told you, I want a Tesla, but 
knowing that all this stuff has to work perfectly in order for it to run normally and, and drive me around. That's scary. Looking <laughs> under the hood. I don't know. For you, it's probably, it puts you at ease because you're like, oh, this is how it works. But for me, it's, yeah, I'm not a data engineer. I'm, I'm very new to all of these terms. Definitely looks complicated. And I think that's why you, uh, data engineers have, have job security. It's not, <laughs> not anyone can just come in and, oh yeah, pipelines, data pipelines. Yeah. But, uh, now the, the cool thing from you, and, and that's what I also like uh, when the engineering is done well, and also the analytics is done well, uh, yeah. you as the customer or the, the person who is owning the car, you have no idea about it. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just there. Um, yeah, I guess like a microwave, so, right? We don't have to yeah, know how a microwave works to heat up our food. <laughs> exactly. It's just a Tesla more complicated microwave. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's I don't it. have any more examples or uh, the time went faster than I thought. Yes. We have three, four minutes to do, take a few more questions and then we're going to do our breakout sessions for networking. Andreas, thank you so much for the presentation. I definitely learned a lot about data engineering. I, I know very little about it. I just think of it as like data plumbing, right? Data pipelines, putting stuff together making sure the data flows from one place to another, but this is definitely eye-opening and I absolutely love the Tesla example. It's something we can relate to because we're like, we can conceptualize a self-driving car. So I think that was a really good example. We had a question come in earlier. Uh, I think this was from George. He's talking about a term called information engineering. And the question is, does it encompass data engineering? So I actually, I'm going to put up my screen because I, I had to Google it. I have never heard of information would... engineering. So according to Gartner, <clears throat> I figured we'd Google it together because why not learn something new? So information engineering, it's a methodology for developing an integrated information system based on the sharing of common data with emphasis on the decision support needs as well as transaction processing requirements, assumes logical data representations are stable as opposed to frequently changing. So I guess it's not like streaming data. Uh, so logical data models, which reflect an organization's rules and policy should be the basis of system development. A lot of words that end up telling me I'm still not quite sure what is information engineering, but the question that George had was, does this sort of fall under mm. the concept of data engineering? As I understand, this information engineering is more the, let's say it's more the umbrella of this, because you want to build some kind and let's stay, let's stick with the Tesla example. You want to, you want to create some features for the customers. Mm -hmm. And for this, you need to first figure out, okay, what's my goal? Which features do I need? And then you need to go back and do this information engineering that you say, okay, what data from where do I actually need? to solve this problem? How does the data look in the early stages or basically in the sources? How do mm -hmm. I then basically mold it into that source of data uh, or combine it or, or pre-process it to, to actually solve the problem then in, in the end? Yeah. This is more of the, of, I would say it's more of a general term. The engineering part is then in the details where you say, okay, here's the database. This is how it looks let's build the pipeline this way let's do these transformation steps in the intermediate transformation steps let's choose this destination database or the other a key value store or a document store why would this and this be better <laughs> so this is how this i think fits together okay yeah i think that's a great way to to answer that for me it's if you've ever seen that Lego, I guess, image going around where it's, this is data and it's just a bunch mm. of Legos, then it's information, it's structured, and then it's visualized. So it becomes knowledge. I guess from that logic, it would fall under the umbrella of data and then go into information. And then I wonder if knowledge engineering is a thing. It probably is. But anyways, we'll take, uh, we'll take one last quick question and then we're going to do the breakouts. So Christine says she's learning about, you know, careers in, in data science and says, I understand how 
analyze data statistically and realize data science interrelates so many areas together, it definitely does. Uh, and there's so much to learn. So she's enjoying the conversation and she's asking, how do you think data is handled and managed will impact some of these different career roles in the future? Data is managed. I guess it goes back to some of that automation, right? Where we're having some of those tedious tasks automated it, with, with machines. It also depends a lot on the setup of your company, of your project. Is there a big management overhead? Then most likely the engineering or governance overhead, then most likely the engineering team will struggle here and there. And there are a lot of discussions have to be made. So this could complicate stuff, could also make stuff clearer. So because you know more about it, data handling, I think this fits a bit more what George asked earlier. Uh, about the automation part, a lot of the handling gets easier. It's not as complicated anymore to, to work with the data. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's great. I know we, we just had another question come in, but we'll do breakout rooms. And then if folks have time to stick, uh, stick around for more questions, I think we can do that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, if you can go on camera, I'm going to stop the spotlight from you, Andreas.